Thank you, Taylor. Good morning. My name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor at FBC, and it is a pleasure to be here on such a wonderful sunny day. Um, I am so glad that you have joined us this morning. Uh, favorite question that I love to ask, don't ask it enough, but my question is this. What did you come here looking for this morning? Are you looking for inspiration, hope, entertainment? Whatever it is that you came here looking for, what I hope that you find is the God who loves you and watches out over you. Did you notice in our singing that Tyler and his team took us on a journey? Did you notice Psalm 121 is all about where do we look when we are in crisis? Where does our hope come from? It comes from the Lord. And then we sang about the wondrous mystery of Christ. You see, how do we know that the Lord is going to deliver on being our hope? We know it because he's proved it in Jesus. When we were God's enemies, he sent his son to die on the cross for us that we might have right relationship with him. And then Jesus was raised again to life in three days. And the same power, the same spirit that lived and raised in Jesus lives in us and gives us new life. So how do we respond to that? The last song we sang, we long to know the Lord better and worship him. And I hope that's what we experience this morning as we look at Micah chapter 2. I had a friend um, some years ago. His name was John. And um, he was a serious student of movies. It would not be accurate to say he was a movie buff. He was way, way beyond movie buff. He had seen every single movie ever to be nominated for any of the five major Academy Awards. He was actually a voting member of the Motion Picture Academy, which meant that he voted on things like Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Movie with Dogs and Singing Chickens, things like that. So going to a movie with him was really kind of an experience, right? It was usually a lot of fun because, first off, he would take us to these movies that, you know, all of his friends we'd never heard of, but were these really great movies coming out of Norway or something, and they were really fun to watch. But then after the movie, it was like we were getting this education. He would talk to us about different things that we probably didn't notice that went in to making the movie and actually carried the movie forward. Things like camera angles, what they did with lighting, and the significance of those things. And it was really fun to learn that stuff. But it was, wasn't always fun to go to the movies with John. Sometimes things went badly. There was one time when three of us went to a movie, and I won't tell you what the movie was because it might be your favorite, but it was a bad movie. It was full of every single movie cliche that has ever been put on film. All the way up to the last scene. And in the very last scene of the movie, the main character is in an ambulance and all of his friends are crying because they are sure that he is dead. And at this point, John had reached his breaking point. And since absolutely nothing unpredictable had happened for the price of his ticket, he decided that he was going to make something unpredictable happen now. 
And John stood up in the theater and in a loud, loud voice said, is there anyone here who actually doesn't know what's about to happen? (laughs) And just to prove him right, at that moment, the back of the ambulance opened and out comes the main character. He wasn't dead. He was just injured. And now he's fine surprising absolutely no one in the theater. Overly predictable movies are bad, right? There's no drama, there's no excitement. But isn't it ironic that we find real life stressful exactly when it becomes unpredictable? We face countless situations with no idea of what's going to happen. And that frightens us. We have had in the last 10 to 14 days in the church just an incredible number of intense and unpredictable crises take place in people's lives. We've had a heart attack, cancer, unexpected loss of family members, a spouse rushed to the hospital near death, and others that I'm not even naming. There are people here today who are hurting, they are frightened, and they would give anything for life to be as predictable as a bad movie. But life isn't a bad movie. I'm going to do something off script here. I'm going to see how badly this goes. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to say anything. If you are someone who is in or entering a really difficult time, would you just raise your hand? Got a lot of people here who are in or entering a really difficult time. The end of Micah 2 is for you. We're in week three of our series on Micah. Micah is a prophet who lived about 700 years before Jesus. His name literally means, who is like God? Now, at the time that Micah lived and prophesied, the nation of Israel was actually split into two kingdoms. Both kingdoms, one was called Judah, the other one still had the name Israel, were doing great. They were prospering financially. They were the envy of many countries around them. However, they were extremely corrupt. We saw in week one and week two that the rich and powerful were greedy and they were taking whatever they wanted from the poor and the powerless. In addition to the internal things that were going on, there was a neighbor, the nation of Syria that was rising up and the Assyrians were about to to pose an extensive threat to both Judah and Israel. In chapters 1 and 2, the prophet Micah makes the fact that crisis is coming very predictable. He announces that God is going to show up to bring an end to the corruption that has characterized Judah and Israel. He's going to do it through an enemy that is going to come in and scatter the people. The nations are going to be overrun. And we know historically that that started to take place. Phase 1 of that happened no later than 20 years after the start of Micah's ministry. Chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2 are a warning that God is coming in judgment. But chapter 2 ends with a completely different tone. Chapter 2 ends with the promise That God will not only come as judge, but God is about to show up as deliverer. And Micah presents God first as coming as shepherd, and then as coming as king in verses 12 and 13. And we're going to look at both of those in turn. And after we look at those, we are going to ask the question, how did Micah want his people to respond? Because that's going to guide us in how we respond. But the message of hope that ends Micah 2 
begins in verse 12 with a picture of the Lord as a shepherd who protects. Now, there's some things I want you to notice about verse 12. First off, it's in first person. That's interesting. Micah is actually quoting God directly. And by using first person, God gives personal assurance that he is going to bring his people back together. In fact, it says that he will surely do it. The Hebrew is literally to gather, I will gather you. It is without question. It's going to happen. The Lord is going to reassemble the people who have been scattered and overrun by an enemy. It's interesting that the Lord describes the people as Jacob and a remnant of Israel. When he talks about Jacob and Israel, that's really just a way of saying, we're including everyone of God's people. No one is going to be left out. Everyone is going to be assembled. But there's one caveat to that. Do you notice it? It's subtle. He doesn't say all of Israel. He says the remnant of Israel. What's the significance of that? That's a subtle reminder that not everyone is going to make it through this alive. It is a subtle reminder that not everyone is going to be left at the end of this. Now think about that for a second. Who are the guilty parties in chapter 1 and 2? They are the leaders, they are the greedy, they are the powerful. But they are not the only ones who are going to suffer when God shows up in judgment. When the enemies come, they are not going to just take the leaders and the greedy and the powerful. They're going to defeat and scatter everyone. And even as God speaks this promise of hope, he reminds the people that your sin has consequences. And your sin has consequences for yourself. But you know what? Your sin has consequences for the people around you. And that's about to play out in the life of the people of Judah and Israel. Verse 12 creates a picture of what God is going to do for his people when he reassembles them. And this is a picture that Micah's audience would relate to well. God is going to set them like sheep in a fold. Now, thankfully, I don't spend a lot of quality time with sheep. So, it's helpful to know what a fold is or was. A fold was a walled-off area that the shepherd would take the sheep to at night where they could sleep in safety. You see, because they were in a walled-off area, it would keep predators out. And the sheep would feel safe, and they would calm down, and they would be able to sleep. It's a picture of God providing physical protection for his people. And they will be, when they are gathered, like sheep who are sleeping safely behind the walls of protection of a fold. Verse 12 then continues that image when it talks about the Lord setting them like a flock in a pasture. A fold is where the sheep hung out at night. The pasture is where they spent their days. Now, the pasture we're pretty familiar with. It's an open area of grass. But here's the thing to remember. There's no protective wall around a pasture. But the sheep still ate and drank as if they were safe. Why? Because the shepherd was with them to protect them. The sheep went to the pasture to have their physical needs met. And while they were there, they were protected By the shepherd, they were kept safe, and so they were allowed to eat and drink safely. You see, the picture of verse 12 is of a shepherd bringing together his flock, protecting them at night and providing for them and protecting them during the day. These are happy sheep. The last line of verse 12 is my favorite line. In this entire passage. Because you have to stop and think about what's going on here. This is actually a very tongue-in-cheek 
this would be a great cartoon. Here's what you have to picture. You have got thousands upon thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of happy, happy sheep in the pasture, feeding, drinking, making happy sheep noises. And then in the cartoon, the sheep are replaced by thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people in the pasture making happy, happy human sounds. Eating and drinking and being safe. That's what he's saying in verse 12. It's just like these sheep that have been brought together and are happy and are so content and are making their little happy sheep sounds. That's the way it's going to be for the people. Just like those sheep, they will be full and well rested. Tyler does a terrific job leading worship for us. Um, One of the things that you may not know about Tyler uh, is that he is, what's the right word for this? Um, A distraction in staff meeting. (laughs) Um, Just one or two staff meetings ago, I have no idea how it came up, but Tyler went into a monologue. And this was a monologue about the difference between being a kid versus being an adult. You see, when you're sick and you're a kid, your mom tucks you into bed, makes sure you're comfortable. She'll bring you tomato soup with crackers and ice cold 7-Up. She takes your temperature and she calls the doctor for you. And when you're an adult, you get your own tomato soup. And so as Tyler was kind of taking us down this journey, we as a staff were kind of thinking fondly about when we were kids and we were sick and mom was in charge and taking care of us. And that is exactly what's going on in verse 12. God wants Micah's audience to emotionally experience his care and protection. A shepherd took personal responsibility for the care and protection of his sheep, and that is what God is going to do for them, and that's what he wants them to experience in their minds through this image of the sheep. If you were Micah's original audience and you heard what we heard in chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, you worry that God has either rejected you or he has forgotten you. And verse 12 addresses that fear before the enemy ever arrives. The enemy is going to come. The people are going to be scattered. The nation is going to be overrun. But God personally assures them that he will be their shepherd. He will bring them back to safety and provision. Now in verse 13, Micah takes up a different fear. He takes up a fear that the circumstances will never change. And he does that by presenting the Lord as the king who protects. It's um, interesting to note that whereas in verse 12, it's in first person. Do you see that it's shifted now to third person? Micah is now taking up the conversation. He is the one who is now speaking. And what he is doing is he is expanding on what God said in verse 12. And he does that through the use of a different picture, a different image. He creates a picture that God is going to be a king. And this king is going to lead his people out of their desperate situation and into victory. And the Lord does two things in verse 13 to highlight this. First thing that Micah says the Lord does is he opens the breach. Now, in those days, cities had these high walls around them, and those were used to protect the city from enemies, kind of like the fold of a sheep, except these were much higher walls. And the effect of having these higher walls was twofold. One is it made it really hard for enemies to come in. But guess what? If you were a captured people, it made it really hard for you to go out. It's not like you were just going to stroll onto a bus and take a ride out of the city. 
you had this obstacle in front of you, this huge wall that made that impossible to get out. So what verse 13 pictures is God punching a hole in the wall so that his people can escape. The second action that the Lord takes is that he personally leads his people out of the city through the wall. He is leading his people to victory. Think about the contrast of this picture with what the people of Micah's day were experiencing with their leaders. Right, Their leaders were the type of people who exploited the people. They took advantage of the people for their own good. They were the sort of leaders that would put the people in the front of the battle, and they would have hidden behind. But that's not the kind of king that our God is. The last two lines stress the direct, personal intervention of the Lord as king. The people will be free because and only because he delivers them. There's one last very subtle thing I want you to notice in verse 13. Do you notice that all the verbs are in present tense? Micah is prophesying something that's going to happen years in the future. Some of this isn't going to happen for well over a century, almost two centuries. But he writes it like, he's ha like it's happening today. What's going on there? Well, this is something that you actually find a lot in the prophets. They write about something future in the present tense because they want you to experience it as if it is happening right now so that you will have complete confidence and know that with certainty, it is absolutely going to happen. God is going to deliver them. He is going to lead them to victory. It is certain. There is no need to question. You guys remember a movie that came out last year? It was nominated for several Academy Awards. It was called Dunkirk. Very good movie. If you haven't seen the movie, what the movie was about is an event that takes place towards the beginning of World War II. And you have almost the entire British army and thousands of other allied troops trapped on the coast of France in this town called Dunkirk. And you've got the German army just approaching them from the east You've got the sea to the west, and that sea is filled with German submarines and German boats, which makes it extremely difficult and dangerous to try to escape that way. And you end up with literally hundreds of thousands of soldiers trapped on open beach in Dunkirk. And guess what German planes do? They just come flying right over, shooting and bombing. This situation was so desperate because it was pretty much the entire British army. That as this is unfolding, Britain seriously debated if they should just go ahead and surrender to the Nazis. But instead, they came up with a different plan. And the plan was to try one desperate rescue attempt. They were going to send over every boat they had. And that was going to include commercial boats. They were going to send over fishing boats. They were going to send over those fun little boats you took on a holiday tour. They were going to send over everything. And they were going to load up their people and get those troops, as many of them as that would survive, back home to Britain. And it worked. 330,000 troops were saved in that operation. Now, here's what's fascinating to read. If you read the accounts of people who were saved and how they reacted. Now, I remember reading the account of one man who said, we felt like failures. We felt like people who had run from the fight. And so... These troops are back in Britain. They get loaded on trains to be taken to where they ever, wherever they need to go next. And he remembered being on this train feeling like a failure. 
And then the train started to go through town after town. And as it would go through a town, people would come out to the train and they would wave and they would cheer. And if the train stopped, they would get on the train and they would bring them food and they would bring them drink and they welcomed them as conquering heroes. Their escape was a victory and the nation celebrated. And that's the emotion that Micah wants the people to feel. There will be another side to the crisis. They will do more than just survive. They are going to celebrate as victors. Chapters 1 and 2 have said that a day is coming when God's people will be overrun by enemies because of the corruption of the leaders and the powerful. They will be exiled. They will be scattered. But then verses 12 and 13 interrupt this word of judgment with a word of hope. God has not forgotten or rejected his people. He is like a shepherd who will gather them together, provide for their needs and protect them. He is like a king who will personally open the way to freedom from their desperation and he will lead them out to victorious celebration. So the question is, what were the people supposed to do with this information? How are they supposed to respond? The answer is a response of trust. You see, when you first look at these verses, it's tempting to think that what Micah wants the people to do is to follow the Lord as he leads them to freedom. But that's what the people in the future are supposed to do. The people who are getting this message still have to face the coming of the enemy. So what does God want them to do? I think the answer is actually in how the prophecies are given. First, Micah brings hope before the crisis starts. The message comes while the people are still okay. God wants them to go through the crisis knowing that his love and grace are always present. He wants them to know from the beginning that his plans are for their good. He wants them to trust that he has not forgotten them or rejected them. And so when you and I go through crisis, we are constantly tempted to think that we are on our own. By God's power, what we need to do is to look at the crisis and say, this is not a sign of God's rejection. This is the effects, the sign that we are fallen people living in a fallen world. But God is still at work even when I can't see it. The second feature of how the prophecy is given is that God does not give a detailed plan. This drives us crazy. He doesn't say when or how or where he's going to gather them. He doesn't tell us what it's going to look like when he's going to break them out of their circumstances and lead them to victory. He just gives them the big picture, and it's such a big picture, it's to the point of being abstract. God's not telling them exactly what he's going to do. He gives them images to create emotions. The emotions that they are going to feel when God does act in these ways. They are going to feel the peace and the calm of being completely protected. They are going to feel the exhilaration of being victorious and free. God wants him. God wants them to trust him more than they trust a plan. See, the plan is far less important than the goal. If I'm Micah's audience, what I really want to know is that I'm eventually going to be safe and free. And that's what these images communicate at a very gut level. God wants them to trust his character. He wants them to trust that he does have a plan, whatever it is, but it's a plan where they will be okay. You see, when we are in crisis, we tend to want to know the why and the when and the how, but God asks us to trust the who. He is at work. I'm not sure when I'm going to stop talking about this ankle surgery that I had, but um, let's continue again today. I don't know about you, but the single worst part of surgery for me 
is anesthesia. Not that I want surgery without it. <laughs> but I don't like the thought of it, right? Because I'm about to go under and I'm going to be completely out of control. There's nothing I can do to ensure that I will be okay. Which if you think about that fear for a second is really stupid. Because it's not like if the surgeon says, oops, <laughs> if I'm awake, I can fix things. But it's just that fear of, of being out of control. There's nothing I can do to ensure that everything's going to be okay. I am totally in the hands of the anesthesiologist. And when the moment comes to put me under, giving a detailed description of the chemicals that are being used and how the dose was calculated and what exactly it's going to do to my body and so forth isn't really what I'm after. What I'm after is knowing that the anesthesiologist actually wants me alive at the end of the procedure <laughs> and that I can trust him that he can pull it off. See, when I allow myself to go under, I am doing a lot more than just intellectually agreeing with the doctor's plan. I am trusting the doctor. Whatever his plan might be, I am trusting him that we can go forward. I am trusting him enough to put my entire well-being in his or her hands. And so I say, I don't know what you're doing, and it scares me. But I trust you, and so we'll go forward. And that's the response that Micah wants from his people. He wants them to trust the character of God, to put their well-being completely in his hands and say, I trust you enough that although I am scared in this situation, we will go forward. When we face crisis, instead of thinking that we face it alone with no hope, we say to the Lord, I feel completely out of control and I am scared. But I know you are my shepherd and you are my king. You will care for me, protect me, and lead me. We are broken people living in a broken world. Not every disease is cured. Sometimes the sin of others create massive chaos in our lives. Sometimes a broken world just seems too much for us to bear. I had a season in my life several years ago where things were so bad, I did not think in terms of living day to day. I literally thought in terms of getting through the next five minutes. I need to get through the next five minutes. And it was a challenge to get through the next five minutes without falling apart. So the question is, what does it mean when you're in a situation like that to say that God is shepherd and king? Looking back, honestly, I think I see more clearly now than in the moment of what it looked like for God to be shepherd and king. In the moment, I was surviving. But looking back, I recognized that God was at work every five minutes to comfort, protect, and to lead. And it came in forms that I would never have predicted. It would be a random word of encouragement for someone who had, from someone who had no idea what was going on. It might be something I read. In one case, and I am not kidding, it was because of one of those fish on the back of a car on Highway 101. These are little things, little drops of grace that sustain us and keep us moving forward. In the moment that I was in, I didn't see how God was at work, but he was. He was being shepherd and he was being king. My job, my response was to trust, to trust that God was at work even when I did not see it, even when I did not know the plan. I needed to keep calling out to the Lord, asking for his help as a constant reminder to myself that I am dependent on him and an acknowledgement 
that he is my true help. It meant asking the Lord every day, every five minutes to help me know him better. The daily reminder that it's more important to know who God is than to know the details of God's plan. If you're one of those people that raised your hand at the beginning of the service, what you need to know is that God is your shepherd and God is your king. And that takes us to the point of the passage. God gives us protection and direction in our darkest hour. When the doctor gives us news we don't want to hear or a close friend betrays us and leaves us to pick up the pieces or when the financial news seems devastating... We want life to be as predictable as a bad movie. We want to know exactly how it will end, and we want to know exactly how we're going to get to that ending. But the Lord gives us something that is actually far more powerful. He gives us himself. He says to us, I give you myself as shepherd and king. And that means as bad as things get, I will be at work caring for you and leading you. You may not be able to recognize it in the moment, but I am here. And so how do we respond? We respond with prayer, dependence, and the desire to know the Lord better. There are also some very practical ways you can respond this morning on the back of this. And the suggestions are, that you will let someone know that you are praying for them to experience God's protection and leading this week. We have people here today who are in or are facing crisis, and they need the reminder that we as the body of Christ stand with them, but far more importantly, their God stands with them as shepherd and king. We need to pray that the Lord will take the truths that he is our protector and he is leading us and drive those truths deeper into our hearts so they are more and more our automatic reaction to the crisis in our lives. And we need to not go through these things alone. Take time to talk about this passage. And then I would encourage you to go back to Micah chapters 1 and 2 and just review what does it say about who God is. That is the most important thing we can take away. Who is God? I'm going to do something else a little bit off script this morning. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. If you're one of the people who raised your hands, or you're one of the people who thought about raising your hands but had no idea what I was going to do and didn't raise your hand, I want to invite you to stay seated. I want to invite everyone else to stand. Why are we doing that? Because we are going to physically demonstrate that we stand with you and for you. Before our Lord, who is our shepherd and our king. Why are these people up front? Because they also want to put a personal touch on that. And so if you are someone who wants someone to just put their arm around them and say, would you pray for me? Would you stand with me? Let me tell you what's going on or not. And just pray for me. Or if you don't know the God who is shepherd and king, and you'd like to know him better, please come talk to one of us. Let's pray. Father, we as a congregation are standing on behalf of people we love, that we care about, who are in deep, deep crisis of some form or another. People who are struggling People who may be looking at a situation and asking the question, God, have you forgotten me? Have you rejected me? 
God, am I not a part of your plan? But before the enemy ever showed up, you brought a message to your people that said there's going to be another side to this. And between now and then, I am with you. And when the other side comes, I will be your protector and I will lead you to victory. Lord, we ask that the people that we pray for this morning would know that at the depth of their soul. Lord, help us as a church to know how to make that tangible to them and to love them well. Thank you, Lord, that you are shepherd and king no matter what we face. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.